All right, so this video is definitely best suited if you've already read the textbook on uh, multivariable functions, and for us it's chapter 13.1. So basically, multivariable functions is instead of f of x, you have f of x, y, or f of x, y, z, and you can graph functions in three dimensions, or if you really wanted to try it, you could use a three-dimensional dimensional representation of a four-dimensional function, or you can just represent functions with lots of variables, maybe not graphically so much as uh, formulaically and, you know, using some functions for it. So that's what we're going to talk about. So a function of two variables, let d be a set of ordered pairs of real numbers. If each ordered pair x, y, and d, there corresponds a unique real number f of x, y, then f is called a function of x and y. The set D is the domain of F, and the corresponding set of values for F of X, Y is the range of F. In other words, when we talk about multivariable functions, 3D functions, your input used to be X and your output Y. Now your input is the set X, Y, and your output is Z, also known as F of X, Y. Your domain is all points on the X, Y plane that are allowed to be plugged into F, and your range is all the outputting z values. So in a multivariable function, there are two or more input variables and one output variable. Okay, so in a multivariable function, you have multiple inputs, but still only one output. Now, since the domain of a multivariable function contains two variables, you can visualize the domain on a Cartesian plane, on a coordinate grid. The range is only one variable, and you can state it in interval notation. So let's say we want to find and graph the domain of each function, describe the range. So if I look at this guy right here, f of x, y equals that. If I think about what I'm allowed to plug into this function, the first thing that stands out is there's an x on the bottom. Well, x cannot equal zero, that's for sure. And then I look at the top, and it's got a square root. And underneath the square root, because we're dealing just in the real numbers here, underneath the square root needs to be positive or zero. It needs to be non-negative. So if I make this into a recognizable equation here, I get x does not equal zero, and x squared plus y squared has to be greater than or equal to nine. Well, we can graph this now and say, all right, well, x squared plus y squared equals nine would be the circle centered at the origin with a radius of 3. And if I want to be greater than or equal to 9, that means I'm outside the circle. And if x isn't allowed to equal 0, that means I am not on the y-axis, so you could maybe just write a note that says that the y-axis is not included here. It's everything to the right and everything to the left of the y-axis that is outside the circle, x squared plus y squared equals 9. So if I look at the next one, I have an ln, and I'm only allowed to put in an input into an ln positive numbers, not even zero, positives. So 8 minus x squared minus y needs to be greater than zero. If I, if I solve for y, I have y is less than 8 minus x squared. Well, let's think about that. y is equal to 8 minus x squared would be an equation that opens down and starts at 8. So that would be y equals 8 minus x squared. I want that to be less than. I want it to be an inequality. So if I erase that, I should really draw it with dotted lines to show that that is not included in the solution. And y needs to be less than that, so I need to shade below the parabola. So there's my domain. 3 over xy, so since the bottom can't equal 0, that means x can't equal 0 and y can't equal 0. So that means my axes aren't included. So it would be everything in this quadrant, everything in that quadrant, everything in this quadrant, everything in that quadrant, but not including the axes. Now, one more thing that I should have done and said it at the beginning, but I might as well say it now. When we're graphing these, because we're talking about a multivariable function here, I really need to indicate what these axes are. Is this an xy axis? Is it a zy axis? Is it a zx axis? So make sure, whoops, sorry about that. 
make sure that you put in uh, your axis labels. All right, and then last but not least, we got this guy. So I've got a square root on top. So three minus X needs to be greater than or equal to zero, which means X is less than or equal to, whoops, that should be a three. X is less than or equal to three. And Y plus two needs to be greater than but not equal to zero because it's on the bottom. So Y is greater than negative two. So let's see, x is less than or equal to 3. So here's x equals 3. And I need to be less than or equal to 3, which would put all this stuff over here. And I need to be greater than or equal to negative 2, pardon me, greater than only, but not equal to negative 2. So now we need to look at the range of the function, and range is definitely harder than domain, so we're kind of going to do the best we can, and I've got to be honest here, there's going to be times where we miss a part of the range that we just didn't anticipate. So we're going to do the best we can and kind of go from there. So if I look at A here, A takes a number that's positive and divides it by a number that could be positive or negative. So I definitely can get both positives and negatives here. I can get zero. Now I've got to think about, can I get things that go all the way up to infinity? Well, let's see. I think I can, because even if x can't get very big for whatever reason, y could get very big, um, and x could be very small at the same time, which would get me toward infinity. And I can get to negative infinity if x is a negative decimal very close to zero. So it looks like for this one, um, my range is going to be all real numbers, uh, and that is going to include zero. So I'm going to say that my range here is that z is all real numbers, or negative infinity to infinity. And then if we look at B here, I think about ln in the domain of just a typical ln function. An ln function goes from negative infinity to infinity. Uh, and if I think about this one, do I think I can get everything? Well, can I get very low numbers close to zero? Yep, I can. And can I get very high numbers? Let's see. Well, I'm subtracting x squared, which is always going to be positive, but I'm also subtracting y. So if y is substantially negative, I can get very high numbers. It looks like here that my range is all real numbers as well. All right, and let's see. Next, I have 3 over xy. So if I look at 3 over xy, can I ever get 0? Well, a fraction only equals 0 if the top equals 0. So my range definitely doesn't include 0. But can I get everything else? Well, if this goes toward infinity, I'm headed toward 0. If one of these is positive and one of these is negative, I can get both positives and negatives. Um, and it looks like, yeah, I can get everything except 0. So my range in interval notation would look like this. And then I think about this guy over here. This is always positive and maybe 0, and this is always positive. So my range definitely could include 0 and positive values. So, so far, I think z is greater than or equal to 0. Now let me see if it could not equal anything else. Um, I think everything else is going to be okay here. So if z is greater than or equal to 0, that seems pretty reasonable. So, yeah, I think that's my range. All right, now last but not least, it says here's pictures of the functions above. See if we can match them up. All right, well, I like to match them up based on domain. So one of these has a domain that can't include the middle of a circle, but includes everything on the outside. That's definitely going to be this guy right here. I got this big gaping hole in the center, and then everything else going on around it. Now, let's see if our range matches up. Oh, I forgot a parenthesis. Let's see if our range matches up. Well, this guy it looks like goes from 0 and down and from zero and up. Now, does it ever touch zero? You can't really see it, but if you can tell, it kind of bends down towards zero here, and this weird asymptote that's happening is kind of getting in the way. But this does include zero, so I am good to go. Ln, now an Ln function goes from negative infinity up to positive infinity. 
Um, and let's see, it's in a parabolic shape when I look at the x-y axis. Well, if I look at this guy, it looks like there's a parabola going this way, and the z's go from very low up to slowly increasing. This is going to be b. This guy, I can't include the x and y axes, so I should have gaps on the x and y axes, which this one does. And it looks like z is positive and negative, but doesn't include 0. This guy is c, which leaves this guy to be d. z is greater than or equal to 0, so it looks like it comes down and stops and then goes up. And it looks like our domain matches, because I just kind of have it in that one square. Looking good. So the next thing I want to discuss is how do you evaluate multivariable functions? And honestly, this part couldn't be easier, so I'm going to try and fly through this. In order to evaluate a multivariable function, you plug in the values. It is that simple. You just have to make sure you're aware of the order. Now, obviously, if it's x and y, x comes first, y comes second. Um, and usually things go alphabetically. But once you start getting into things where you're calculating a multivariable function in context, you might have productivity based on labor and capital, and it's L comma C, and you just need to know which one goes where. But so let's say I have um, f of 1, 2, and it's 3 over x, y. 1 is x, 2 is y. 3 over 1 times 2 is 3 halves. Oh, goodness, that was so easy. 3 over 2 times negative 3 is negative 1 half. Oh, goodness, still so easy. Uh-oh, here's a variable. Still easy, 3 over 3 times k is 1 over k. All I'm doing is plugging these numbers in. Let's plug in 3 and 1. Well, if I plug the 3 in up here, I get 0. 0 over radical 3 is still 0. Oh, what happens? I'm going to plug in the 4, so I have the square root of 3 minus 4 over the square root of negative 1 plus 2. Wait a minute, that's the square root of a negative. This does not exist. You can say this is undefined, something like that. But that would not be a point that is in the domain of that function. And then g of a, b, well, we'll replace the x with a and replace the y with b. Ta-da, done. Does f following g of 3, 2 have meaning y or y not? Well, that would be f of g of 3, 2. So that would be f of, well, let's see, g of 3, 2 is going to be 0, and f of 0, wait a minute, f needs an x and a y, and I just have one number. So this has no meaning because f is a multivariable function, and we only have one variable. Okay, ta-da. All right, level curves and contour maps. Let's see, what am I talking about down here? Well, a contour map is a lot like a contour map you've seen if you've taken earth science, although I hear a lot of you skip earth science nowadays, and that's just ridiculous. So you should take earth science. Do you remember those topology maps and the weather maps, and you've got like the isobars and the isotherms and all those different things? You do the same thing in multivariable calculus. A contour map is a set of level curves for a multivariable function where the dependent variable is set equal to a value and the resulting equation is graphed on a 2D plane. So what does that mean? It says, okay, well, f of x, y is this. I'm going to say, let's let z equals 0. So that would mean I have the square root of x squared plus y squared minus 9 equals 0, which gives me the equation x squared plus y squared equals 9. If I let z equal 2, the square root of x squared plus y squared minus 9 equals 2. If I square both sides, x squared plus y squared equals 4, add the 9, I get 13. If z equals 4, I have x squared plus y squared minus 9 square rooted equals 4, again setting this equal to the value. Square both sides and add the 9, and I get 25. x squared plus y squared equals 9, x squared plus y squared equals 13, and x squared plus y squared equals 25 are all circles. So the contour map for this, and again, you always want to put in your axes so I know what I'm graphing this on. My contour map would be x squared plus y squared equals 9 is a circle with a radius of 3. 
And a lot of times you'll see either C equals or Z equals, I'm gonna write C, zero, because you're saying what are you setting it equal to? X squared plus Y squared equals 13 is just under four. So I'd have a circle there and X squared plus Y squared equals 25 has a radius of five. So my contour map would look something like that. What it tells me is if I were to slice this function using planes of z equals zero, z equals two, and z equals four, when I slice it, the bottom of the slice would be circles. So getting that idea of slicing in your head now, let's try and match these up. So if I were to like slice this through, okay, using planes like this, if I were to slice it through, I'd see a whole bunch of parabolas, right? This is the y-axis, this is the x-axis right here. So I would see a bunch of parabolas starting up at high y's and going down. This is the contour map for that function. If I slice this guy, ignore the bell in the background if you heard it. If I slice this guy, I'm gonna get a bunch of these curvy hyperbolas in there. And if I slice down here, I get other curvy hyperbolas. So curvy hyperbolas go up, there it is. Ding, ding, ding. This one's the most fun. If I slice this near the middle, you can see the circles that are gonna crop up. And if I slice it down here, I don't have any circles anymore. I just kind of have like this weird, I don't know, ringy thing. This guy looks like that. And if I slice this here, I get a line. If I slice it there, I get a line. If I slice down here, I get another kind of a line. This looks like that. And that's it. That's all I really wanted to talk about. Hopefully you've looked at the book and you've played with the website. Um, I may make a follow-up video just showing you some cool stuff about that uh, multivariable website later. Uh, but hopefully this helped you understand what a multivariable function is and how it's useful. Uh, we have a dinosaur joke today. What is louder than a dinosaur? Two dinosaurs.